Good morning. Thank you, Denzel. Um, and good morning to everybody. And thank you all for being here. Um, I'm going to share my screen with you a moment and get started. Uh, but uh, first, I just wanted to say a couple things. Um, so first of all, I was here yesterday, and it's really my pleasure to be part of such an exciting, engaged conference. Every minute of yesterday's talks were fantastic. Uh, before I start today, I want to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you all from Boston, where I teach at Boston University, as Denzel mentioned. Um, and I am on the historic lands of the Wampanoag and the Massachusetts people. These lands that we are on in the United States are not our own. And although this is a virtual conference and you are all logging on from other places, you are on the historic homelands of other nations and sovereign entities. Um, and I think it's important to keep that in mind as we start. I also want to acknowledge that I am speaking to you today about anti-racism, which is a hugely important topic, but I am white and I acknowledge that I benefit every day from white privilege. So I'm speaking to you in the spirit of humbleness and humility from my own perspectives and my own experiences. And I really hope that we can explore these topics together. All right, let me share my screen with you and get started. Okay, um, so uh, I'm so glad that people already put in the chat where you're from, um, what level you're teaching at. That's really important to know and I really appreciate that people were able to do that. Uh, the first thing that I wanna start out with is a collaborative Padlet. Uh, and I believe that I can put the link in the chat there for you. Um, I'd just like you to think about what it actually means to have an anti-racist classroom. Um, and so if everybody has that link, I'm going to navigate to the Padlet myself um, and see what is coming up here. So you can type right into this. I believe that everyone has used Padlets before. Um, it was in the homework for yesterday's sessions. Uh, so thank you um, for putting the link in the chat. So you can just click right on there anywhere and start typing. So you can start typing anti-racist classrooms mean or anti-racist attitudes in my students mean, um, and really just any thoughts at all. I like this. I see community safety for my learners, actually addressing issues of racism, right? So not avoiding things. Being aware of students lived experience and background knowledge empowering students, a place where everyone is valued. These are fantastic. Listening to student stories, absolutely. Embracing and accepting. Culturally responsive. So just kind of looking at these as they pop up um, and you'll have access to this after the talk as well if you wanna go back and take a look at them later. Um, what I'm seeing here is, um, on the one hand, I'm seeing the theme of empathy, of kind of thinking about the student population that we're working with. Um, and of course, I'm seeing uh, the theme of equity. Um, but I'm also seeing this undercurrent of activism, of action, um, of not just uh, diverse readings and multicultural topics, but, but all of these emphasis on action, um, checking your own implicit bias. These are fantastic. And this is really what I'd like us to keep in mind as we begin. So I'm gonna go back to my slides. Um, and if people continue typing in there, that's absolutely fine. Um, you're free to do that. So I'll tell you a little bit about my context. So I've been teaching at Boston University for the last 18 years. Before that, I worked at community colleges um, and intensive English programs, uh, both in the community with, you know, kind of, um, it, I taught English at Harvard for, through a program for their janitors and some of the lab workers, people who fed the animals um, in some of the bio labs. Uh, they were offered free English classes by the university. So that was my first job actually out of my master's program. So what I'm talking to you about, um, I think is applicable to, you know, high school students, to adult ed, to community colleges, to higher ed in different contexts. And I've really been thinking a lot about moving from multicultural to anti-racist. So it feels like we've done a decent job of diversifying our curriculum to a certain extent and being multicultural, but there's so much more to it than that. 
So just a little bit about the framework and approaches that um, I'm approaching this from. So I'm kind of thinking of this as having several different angles here um, that you can approach this goal of anti-racist classrooms through the side of curriculum, um, through thinking about pedagogy and through thinking about self-reflection and the red circle on self-reflection. That's mostly what we'll be talking about today. Um, I've been thinking a lot about removing some of the policing aspects of grading students, of checking homework, of you know, kind of removing that out of the classroom. Because again, I am white and most of the instructors in my program are, and most of the students in our class are students of color. Um, and that becomes a very uncomfortable dynamic. So I've been thinking about labor-based grading contracts, um, Asao Inoue, uh, thinking about his perspective on this. Um, Ibram Kendi, who is now at Boston University, actually thinking about um, teaching excerpts from his book in my class. And actually it, um, it lends itself really well to short excerpts because part of it is memoir, um, part of it is um, sort of exhortation. So I can often use this even in lower level classes. And then a book that I've found really personally very helpful and we'll be doing an activity from in a little while is the Racial Healing Handbook by Annalise Singh. So these are some of the overall perspectives that I'm using to approach this work. Um, I'm going to really quickly give you some perspectives from the literature on this as far as just thinking about this a little bit more. Um, and I've mentioned already that we want to diversify not just our reading lists, but also the scholarly frameworks of our teaching. Um, and that might mean, for example, that when we have the opportunity to bring in a guest speaker, um, that we really work hard to think about, you know, can we bring in a black woman um, to speak on an issue? Um, can we diversify um, our reading list and the very texts that we use in teacher training as well? Um, and then examining our own racial identities and views. This is a really useful um, article, just came out last year, a lesson in teaching English while white, just a very um, humble, um, interesting article uh, to think about. Uh, and then allowing our students of color, our marginalized international or transnational students to be seen, to claim space and identities on campus. So that's kind of the perspective from the literature. And I'll tell you that on um, our own campus, this is something that we've really been trying to work on. So we know that students of color often find themselves feeling invisible in spaces on campuses. And again, I am talking specifically about post-secondary institutions here, um, but imagine the trickle down effect as well into high schools, et cetera. Um, so students of color often find voices from their communities silenced this invisibility and silencing can be pervasive. Uh, and at BU, <coughs> excuse me, we just opened up a, I'm sorry. We just opened up a center for first-generation college students. Um, I'm a first-generation college student myself. And the center on campus works really hard to kind of connect first-generation faculty with first-generation undergrads and first-generation grad students. Many of them are immigrants, many of them are international students, many of them are students of color. So this is very much an intersectional approach. On our campus, um, we had a report that was done uh, in February of this year. And we, uh, it, this was among people who are not specifically in the writing program, not specifically teaching international students or immigrants, um, but we're talking about those ESL students on campus. Uh, and in general, people said the English instruction is good. You know, they, the, the classes that help them with their English, those are great, those are working, but students are still really isolated. And at Boston University and many other campuses, international students, so formally international students who are actually here on you know, F1, et cetera, visas, make up about 24% of undergrads. And in some graduate programs, it is much higher than that. It kind of depends on the school and the program. Uh, we do have a fair number of immigrant students um, who may be naturalized citizens or green card holders. Um, we don't have a really firm number, um, a firm number of them because they come in through different programs. Uh, but that in general, the international students are feeling like they're not connected to campus, like they don't belong. And so we've been trying to think of ways to bridge that gap. So our plan was to work on this from three different fronts. That, as I said, we're working on the pedagogy. We're, we're, we're using diverse content 
we're working towards inclusive pedagogical practices. This might include teaching what's called the hidden curriculum. So that if you have a generally a white American student from an upper middle class high school, for example, they come to college having heard of office hours. They have heard of a syllabus. Um, whereas many of the immigrant students, many of our international students have not. They don't know what this is. So when the professor says it's in the syllabus, check the syllabus, they don't really know what that means. We've also decided to really teach students about the history of institutional racism. This can be redlining, school desegregation, um, forced busing. Um, so really trying to teach these difficult topics historically. Um, and then moving into the present that teachers and students were both going to reflect on and discuss race, racial identity and racism. So I'll give you just a really, really quick overview of some of the content that I've shared with students this past year. We've had optional workshops for students. So um, we held them over Zoom, of course, this past year. Uh, but after classes ended, we wanted to see who wants to learn more about racism, anti-racism. Uh, and we talked to them about the Black Joy movement that is happening in Boston and some wonderful, wonderful murals that we have around the city. And as a follow-up resource, we told the students who were in Boston they could go on you know, safe, socially distant, outdoor walking tours of many of the murals and the public art in historically Black neighborhoods. Um, we gave students these little factoids. And again, this is kind of focused on students um, where we said, did you know the term BIPOC has only come into usage very recently? And we deliberately used that term and kind of threw it at students because of our sense that in general, our students, even though they may be students of color, tend not to identify themselves in that way. Even though here walking into the United States, that is a label that is sometimes put on them. So um, we quoted from the New York Times, we gave them a definition of what this means, what it actually stands for. And we talked about kind of historical terms that they may have encountered. Um, so African-American, Negro, colored, kind of thinking about these different terms here. Um, we talked to students about the makeup of Boston itself. And of course, this is going to vary depending on where you are and the student group that you're talking to and the population that you're working with. But we talked about how Boston is technically a majority minority city, but significantly segregated due to a history of redlining. We knew students would not know that term. So we introduced it explicitly in each of these slides. I'm giving them to you here very, very quickly. These were accompanied by lots of discussion, lots of activities for students around them. Um, so we went back to actually the, the very origin of the term redlining, um, where the homeowners loan corporation drew a red line around little, little parts of a map um, to say whether they believed that uh, the, the property values would increase or decrease in value based on the race and ethnicity of their inhabitants. Um, and then we showed the maps of Boston. So this might be a little bit small for you to see, but as always, the slides will be posted after this um, and you will have access to them. So this map on the left shows you Boston population by race and ethnicity. Um, the map on the right shows you Boston population by race and ethnicity in different neighborhoods. And so you can see that some neighborhoods are majority white. Um, some neighborhoods are majority um, Latino, for example. And so we talked about this and what this means and where BU is um, here. So we then talked about kind of the effects on the city that in 2019, Boston actually changed the name of a main business district in Roxbury, a historically black neighborhood. It was formerly known as Dudley Square, but it was named after a colonial era slave owner, Thomas Dudley, and they renamed it Nubian Square. Um, and this is a very, very important moment. And now this was Nubian Square last year and they just refreshed the mural um, a week or two ago. It was so exciting to see. You know, I went down in person, I didn't change these slides, but I went down in person and took pictures on uh, the street as they were actually doing this. So we shared this with students. We gave them maps of the city and told them you can go here, you can go around, you can see the city. Um, we talked about Black Lives Matter because our students have heard of it. But while our international students, many of them again from Asia or the Middle East, they have heard of Black Lives Matter and they have heard of Martin Luther King. And sometimes those are the only two things they might know about race in the United States you know, in this century. 
um, or I guess in the uh, 20th and 21st century. Uh, and so we talked about how Black Lives Matter may be seen as Martin Luther King Jr.'s legacy, that they're not separate. Martin Luther King is, oh, nice, tolerance, be gentle, be kind, and Black Lives Matter as this kind of scary militant group, which is what some of our students, again, coming from Asia, might have heard or internalized, um, but that rather these may be linked. Uh, then we moved into talking about anti-Asian hate crimes and bias, and this was, again, discussed so wonderfully yesterday by some of the presenters. Uh, when I was talking to students, it was just um, within a few days of the events in Atlanta. And so we were able to talk about that with them. Uh, we were able to say that racism isn't just black and white. Um, we, we showed them examples from, this was a rally that happened on the Boston Common. Um, and again, these were all, I think it was really important to students that these were local pictures and local resources. So I would encourage you to kind of adapt this to whatever area you're teaching in um, and kind of helping students see themselves as part of this community, not as outsiders to it. Um, and again, thinking about Boston Chinatown leaders pledging solidarity with the black community from last year in 2020, um, and then communities working together. So really trying to form some of these bonds. Um, and then we approach the idea of anti-racism, that learning more about anti-racism uh, is the process of being open to correction and about learning. And we gave students this um, you know, little Twitter thread, um, which they were super excited about. Uh, so um, again, it might be sort of small, I apologize. When you're practicing anti-racism, be grateful for direction. Uh, and then um, the author Marie Beecham makes this wonderful analogy to thinking about math. So if you're doing math and someone sees that you've miscalculated something, you wouldn't want them to keep quiet. You'd want them to tell you that what you've done is wrong and help you do it correctly. Similarly, when you make a math error and someone says, hey, you'll wanna change that, they're not saying that you're not smart or that you didn't try at all. They're saying you'd benefit from taking a second look because they must think you're capable of taking direction. So when it comes to math, you'd wanna receive that help and guidance. You'd be grateful. Similarly, when you're discussing race and someone offers wisdom and perspective, they are investing in you in that moment. They're trusting you. They're showing that they think that you're capable of growth and you should be grateful for that. So this was for our students, a really new perspective. Um, it was something that, you know, they know that race is an uncomfortable topic. They don't want to offend anyone, but they're also sort of uncomfortable about possibly saying something wrong and getting some kind of correction. So we introduced this idea specifically. Um, then uh, this is an activity that we did with the students um, and I'm hoping that we can do it here right now. You're not going to have time uh, with students. So, you know, we gave them about 20 minutes to actually write and reflect on this. Um, I'm not gonna give you all 20 minutes in the interest of time today. But these are questions by Annalise Singh from her Racial Healing Handbook. And I'd like you to think about when you first heard the word racism, who said the word, where were you? What did you learn in your family about the history of racism? And if you didn't learn about racism in your family, write about how you feel about that. What did you learn in your schools about the history of racism or, or other places? Um, okay, so I'm going to share with you a little bit about um, what came out of this. So, oops, sorry. So out of that day, when we um, had students reflecting on this, we were then able to work together in groups of teachers and students, but not specifically in the classroom, to talk about what students had written. Um, and so this is what one instructor wrote about a student um, who was in their group. And she said, a Panamanian student who identified as Jewish was feeling reluctant to talk about issues around race because she said, you never know what isn't okay to say, such as the response to Black Lives Matter that all lives matter. Um, she also described her own experience as a religious minority and indicated that she had gotten reactions such as, oh, you're Jewish. That's why you got accepted because of diversity. So we talked a bit about attitudes towards race in Panama, and she claimed that essentially there weren't any, but then identified how being white was perceived. So she could identify that there was a distinction, but she didn't label it as any sort of racism. And this is something, this is an attitude that felt very, very typical of many of the students that we were working with. So students who were able to say, well, yes, Black Lives Matter, but they couldn't quite see why all lives matter 
was such a stigmatized response. Um, and that's something that we could address and we could talk about the context there behind the all lives matter response. Um, and then students who are able to say, well, you know, in my country, in my wherever I'm from, uh, there, we don't really have this level of racism. Uh, but with a little bit of pushing and prodding, we're able to kind of say, well, yes, you know, maybe people with lighter skin are valued more and we were able to talk about colorism then. Mm -hmm. Um, this is now a teacher who was uh, responding and saying again about what, what happened in her group. She said, one student from the Philippines said the only thing she can think of is that her parents told her she should never marry a black man. We engaged in a conversation about why she thought that might be. She said she wasn't sure, but she knew her parents were not familiar with black people. This led to a discussion about our parents, older generations, um, how viewpoints evolve over time. Um, the active pursuit of knowledge and awareness. It was illuminating discussion, though I'm sure the students felt a bit awkward discussing it with instructors. I was really impressed with all they shared and how they opened up their bravery and vulnerability in discussing these issues. So here are more things that students wrote. So a student wrote, I learned about racism online. Um, you know, just maybe as um, all of you responded, Google searches when Denzel asked that poll at the beginning, this is where our students are learning about racism because I'm from China and we are all Chinese. So racism doesn't happen here. We think that foreigners are good and we like people from America even though they have white skin. Um, a student from Taiwan, I haven't experienced racism or really heard about it because in Taiwan, almost everyone is the same and we don't have stereotypes. My cousin went to California, then she told a story about her cousin um, being mugged in a convenience store in the middle of the night. Um, and she said, anti-Asian racism is when everyone thinks Asians have a lot of money and that is a stereotype. And the black man who robbed my cousin thinks or thought that he won't fight back. So this was a student from the UAE. Um, he said, I come from a Muslim country. Locals are only 10% of the population in my city. Everyone else is from another place. So immigrants, foreign born, the city is very diverse. This year is the year of tolerance there, because if we don't have good relations with foreigners, if we have racism and we don't have tolerance, then we don't have good economies or good ways of living. So I like that on the one hand, he had a very instrumental um, sort of motivation for tolerance um, and anti-racism, which is it helps the economy. On the other hand, he also had a philosophical and religious argument. And he said, Islam contradicts racism. If you are racist, you are not a good Muslim. Islam fought the idea of having Africans as slaves. It fought for equality. And that is something very important to me. And so this is a student who is able to kind of make space for himself in the discourse of anti-racism and able to say, look, this is my religion. This is part of my identity. Um, teachers, when we ask them to reflect on this, uh, had you know, kind of positive responses, but questions. Um, and I just want to highlight the last one here. Um, a white instructor said that one a student said, teacher, you are the only foreigner in the room. Um, and she said, this was this sudden intrusion of whiteness into the classroom when suddenly she realized that everyone else there in, in that particular case was from a country in Asia. Um, and they were identifying her as the foreigner. And she felt startled. Um, and it was just a very, it opened up a very interesting conversation. Um, this was a Padlet that I had students do um, and teachers worked on it collaboratively with them, thinking about what is anti-racism or what is an anti-racist response. And you'll see that there are a few responses that highlight the theme of activity. So anti-racist is active, actively calling out, being aware of racist acts. But on the other hand, there are a lot of responses here that talk about stereotypes and tolerance and what we, we might think of as this more passive level that is not yet rising to the level of anti-racism. Um, when we asked students what questions they had, and this was completely anonymous, we got this very illuminating response uh, on the top right. Someone said, why does all this matter to us? We are from China. We are not a part of this. And even when we live in Boston, we are okay. So that some students, again, not all, but some, may see this as being something outside of them um, that doesn't really affect them at all. You know, oh, that's between blacks and whites in America. That's not me. I'm only here for college. I'm only here for a job. I'm, all, I'm only here for graduate school, you know, whatever that is, that they are not a part of this. Um, but of course, by existing in the United States, by walking around the city, 
they are a part of this and we are really trying to have students feel that they're a part of this. So the conflict that we found we needed to deal with um, is that on the one hand, we want to move students from this level where they're aware of stereotypes and that they're bad. They're aware of individual bias. And we want them to start thinking about institutional racism, racially based structures and racist systems. We want them to start thinking about the problem with so-called colorblind racism. Um, our plan, and this is still ongoing, so this is you know, trying to get at the idea that this is a recursive process that we, we need to do more on this. Um, so these were the first same three bullets that I gave you near the beginning. Teachers use diverse content and work towards inclusive pedagogical practices. Students learn about the history of institutional racism. We do some reflecting. We realized we needed to go back and do some more actual teaching to our students. So um, this was um, a, something that went viral um, about four years ago now, um, and it, it was on Facebook and then many news outlets picked it up. Um, it was even reported in England and other places. Um, and the mother of the white child who posted uh, originally shared this and said, you know, my son doesn't see any difference and that's just how it is. You know, there's no difference at all between my white son and his black friend. You know, the teacher treats them the same, society treats them the same. Um, and there was a little bit of a pushback um, that said, well, you're, you're saying this from the perspective of white privilege. You will never have to have the talk about police with your son. Whereas your son's black friends, parents probably will have that conversation with him. Um, and so we talked about this with students. Um, we talked about kind of the theories of what it means to be colorblind uh, and is that good? And how people who say, oh, I don't see color tend to be people who are white or who benefit from white privilege and who may have the privilege of not seeing color. That for a person of color, they don't have the privilege of not seeing color. Then we asked our students, um, you know, how do you identify? And we found that um, in general, most of them really identify by their national identity. And this is not to say that their national identity should not be important to them. Of course it should, that's, that's wonderful. Um, but trying to think about themselves um, and, and all of these students who were surveyed, um, except for a very small uh, number of them were students of color. Um, so we asked them then, how comfortable are you using the terms such as, you know, anti-racism, um, POC, BIPOC, you know, and generally they said not so comfortable, I get confused, I have questions, or even the ones who said pretty comfortable, I might still be using them wrong. So this led us to actually have a lesson where we talked about the language of race. Uh, on a really basic level, we talked about racist versus a racist, so adjective versus noun um, and how articles cue parts of speech here. We talked about colored people versus people of color, that colored people is an outdated term that they should not be using. But again, for students who are just starting to have control, um, you know, the, the ED ending, we know that that might not always be um, in perfect control for them. They might not pay attention to the um, preposition people of color. And many of them have read in their classes excerpts from Martin Luther King's um, speeches um, where he uses words like Negroes, for example. So we talked about words that they might use today. Um, we talked about Hispanic versus Latino, Latina or Latinx um, and what that means as well. Um, we talk about how we can generally use the terms black and white but that generally we don't use the term yellow for discussing race, although there is um, a fantastic book called Yellow, Race in America Beyond uh, Black and White by Frank Wu. And I sometimes use, it's, it's pretty academic, so I, I sometimes just allude to it. I don't really use too many excerpts from it. Um, but sometimes um, one of the readings that some of our instructors use is this essay by George Orwell, Shooting an Elephant, about his experiences in what was then known as Burma. And George Orwell uses the term yellow. And so we talk about how just because an author is using this word, that doesn't necessarily mean that you can or should use it in your writing. We talk about a black person, which is an okay thing to say versus a black, um, where you're using that as kind of a noun and that that is not a way that we discuss people's race. And students, my, my Chinese students tend to do this all the time. They will very comfortably say, um, I am a Chinese. 
um, you know, and they'll use it that way. But we say, well, you know, it could be considered pejorative if you say a black. So in a very unemotional way, just giving them the language and the associations of the language. Um, so we explicitly centered the issue of erasure that comes up with all lives matter. Um, we tell them about BIPOC and how you say it. Um, and then we talk about the N word. Um, and this is, there's a fantastic little clip available on YouTube from ta Coates on words that don't belong to everyone. Um, it's really short um, and it's really, really accessible. Um, you know, I would say, uh, you know, middle school students even can uh, access this. He starts out by saying, um, if, if he were walking down the street um, and a strange woman um, came up to him and called him honey, well, that would be a little bit weird, but his wife calls him honey. So what's going on there? And everyone can understand that there might be a pet name that your spouse um, or someone in your family calls you that strangers wouldn't. And then he kind of extends this a little bit further. Um, and he talks about maybe a word that his gay friend might use when talking about the gay community. He talks about a word that his wife and her girlfriends might use when talking amongst themselves. Um, and then he works his way up to the N word. And he says, look, you know, you don't get to use this word. If you are white, you do not get to say this word. Um, and it's really, really explicit. And so it's interesting as far as he builds the argument. Students love this. They love having this broken down for them in that way. Um, sometimes I might also give students this, which is um, just a long list. I might excerpt it um, or just, you know, just give them a couple to respond to of things that former students have said to me. And then ask them, what do you think? You know, pick one in your group. How would you respond to it? Um, so Asian students don't need to worry about racism in Boston. How would you respond to that? You know, agree, disagree, why? Um, and when I'm putting them in groups for this, I try to make the groups as diverse as possible so that they are working with people who might have different perspectives on this. What this does is they're addressing some of these issues but not in a way that they're saying, you know, this person in this room said this, and now you have to worry about not offending them. That you're really trying to address this in a way that is less controversial, less of a hot button issue where they're worried about offending the person in the room. Um, I sometimes give them this article as well. Um, so this, a former student of mine wrote, um, uh, so she wrote it now six years ago. It was published in The Guardian in their op-ed. Uh, my colorblind college campus is still racist. My white peers just don't see it. But of course, in order for students to access this, first they had to have some sense of what it means to be colorblind and why that might be problematic. Um, and then I will, um, this is the last kind of student voice I have for you. This is a poem that a student from Singapore wrote. Um, it's actually just the first stanza of it. It's, it's about an eight stanza long poem. He was very, very inspired by all of this discussion of racism and anti-racism. Uh, and so he wrote this poem kind of thinking about some of the colonialist history in Singapore um, and uh, how Singapore likes to think of itself as being a very diverse place. Um, and on paper it is. Um, but kind of thinking about the way that whiteness is still privileged, the way that colorism is still present in his native land. So I have one um, last thing for you here. Um, and I have a Google Doc that I would love it if you could fill out. Um, but uh, we can also have some discussion. Um, so if possible, let's see if I can put the Google Doc in the chat here. Um, just a moment. Sorry, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Um, and if people can respond to this, and I would be really happy to open it up to questions um, if people I know have been typing really actively in the chat, which is fantastic. Um, let's see what questions that people have. Yes, I think this idea of uh, open discussion, depending on where you are, is really difficult. It can be. Um, I mean, I think, you know, my, my thinking is uh, that if you are working, especially if you're working in an ESOL classroom, um, our main currency is language, right? That's, that's our basic job. So I think kind of approaching the language aspect of it um, is probably the way in that I would use. Um, and just kind of thinking about, because students like hear these terms everywhere, um, 
you know, what is a URM? If they see, you know, e URM, they might even see that on posters. Maybe um, in Boston, there is a bike share uh, and there are posters hanging up in, in outside the library that says, you know, free bike share memberships for URMs. Um, you know, what does that mean? Can someone apply if you're an underrepresented minority? Um, so kind of thinking about that. Um, when students just want to study English, how to bring race and racism into the curriculum when they aren't there yet? That is a great question. Um, and what I would say is, you know, we know that um, you can teach English with any kind of content. You know, any kind of content can be the vehicle. We can have students, I once taught a summer class, um, this was like running out of a church basement, this was years ago, uh, and it happened that three of the four students in the class were studying to take the road test. And so literally what we used as our main content was the driver's manual and various different videos about road safety. Um, so we know that you can teach English with any kind of content. Um, I would say thinking about having your content, our content is never race neutral. If we think it is, we are just telling ourselves a story. Um, so thinking about choosing our content deliberately um, and having students read things that, you know, may be a little bit provocative, that might push them a little bit, um, while telling them it's okay to disagree with this. And partly you're working on language that students can say, I disagree because, or, you know, in my opinion. Um, Let's see. I'm wondering as well, you know, thinking of the Immigrant Learning Center's English language program where you have such a diversity of people in a classroom, uh, if racist issues were to arise, um, you know, at the beginning of, of, of the term, everyone is, is with their own groups. Um, by the end of the term, you know, everyone is mixed up and mingled and, and they learn about each other. But at the start, you know, uh, Jewish students and Muslim students, uh, students from different parts of the world that may be warring, you know, how, do you, how, how would we deal with that through the curriculum, perhaps? That's a great question. Um, I mean, I think that all teachers have the experience of um, working to make some kind of classroom community. Um, and often, you know, obviously this is going to differ depending on whether you're at an elementary school level or adult ed or, you know, university level, but all teachers have ways of making sure that the community, um, you know, is, values everyone. And I think highlighting that right from the beginning, um, you know, whether it's a class compact, um, so one thing that uh, is gaining uh, popularity in universities is thinking about a compassion clause, thinking about, you know, kind of what that means. What does compassion mean that we're going to approach everyone in the class, you know, a little bit maybe more um, social justice oriented than just giving them the benefit of the doubt, uh, but that we're going to assume that people are here um, with good intentions. Um, and I'll, I'll say that I've been in, um, I was in a class where uh, it was a very diverse class. There were students from, you know, there were there was a white man from Spain. There were some students from India, a few Chinese students, um, someone from the Middle East. Uh, and uh, at one point, one of the Chinese men um, was telling a story, and then he he had he was one of the less proficient speakers. So clearly, some of the difficulty that he ran into was linguistic. Um, but he was telling a story and he ended up by saying something, you know, oh, you know, everyone knows Asian women, um, Asian women, very strong. And then he continued from there. And it's possible that he meant this in a um, positive way, but people in the room were not reacting positively to it. So I said, I, I lifted my hand and I was about to say, I'm going to pause you right there, <laughs> you know, and, and try to bring things back. Um, and before I had the chance to say anything, um, there was a man, um, he was from Brazil, who happened to be sitting next to him. And he slapped him on the back and said, dude, you can't say that here. <laughs> and then all of a sudden that, that broke the moment and everyone started talking and you know, someone said, well, as an Asian woman, I think. Um, so what I thought was so powerful about that moment is, so on the one hand, I was, I was ready to say something, you know, I, I wasn't just, it was hard, but I wasn't sitting there frozen. You know, I knew that we had to do something, but I love that the students in the room also felt that kind of responsibility to the community. 
Um, and that was relatively early in the semester. Um, and they were able to, you know, just kind of speak up and do that. So often I tell students, you know, kind of an abridged version of that uh, near the beginning of class. And I say, we are all members of this community. Um, another thing that uh, people can do is you can have, I don't know if you have this in your particular program, but having kind of an anonymous, um, you know, a question or issue box, whether that is a physical box in the, you know, outside the teacher's office, you know, somewhere unattended, uh, that students can put pieces of paper with concerns in on, um, or an anonymous Padlet, for example, an anonymous Google Doc that people can add to, um, so that people can say, you know, I felt a little bit uncomfortable when. Um, so something like that. And Cooney had a great question about ethnocentrism and, you know, given the rise of nationalism and populism, not just in the U.S., but around the world, how, how would you approach something like that? Definitely. Um, I mean, I think it's very connected in a lot of ways. Um, you know, I think that thinking about the particular context that people are teaching in uh, really matters here. So um, I might just sort of there, there are so many really interesting articles that approach it from one particular, um, you know, one particular culture, for example, um, with regard to another. And I might choose something that is not highly represented in the room. So again, so that students are able to discuss this issue in a way that is not, well, I'm from country X and you're from country Y, um, and they're not at loggerheads in that particular way. Um, so I had a student from the Philippines who uh, wrote a really interesting essay about uh, a Filipino soap opera that came under uh, fire for paying the uh, lighter skinned lead much more than the darker skinned lead. Um, and uh, what was fascinating about this was no one else in the room was from the Philippines. And so everybody was able to discuss this issue of, col of colorism I and mean, I'm just using that as an example, you could of course discuss ethnocentrism or something else in a way that was not particular to their society. So she was giving them this context and they were able to say, hmm, well in my country, and then they started thinking about it and making these connections. Um, so anything that removes it from the people in the rooms so that it's not one person um, kind of attacking another person, but rather looking at this in, um, you know, possibly we might say a more academic, uh, or hypothetical context. And as we close out, uh, Chris's cat just made an appearance in the chat box, uh, but he sort of wanted to, under, to ask, you know, teachers who only want to teach science or math, you know, how do you work to understand why this is important? Mm -hmm. That is a great question. Um, I would say just thinking about the fact that when, when we go anywhere, we go as our whole self. Um, and whether that is in a math classroom or, you know, whether we're taking the train, whether we're in an ESOL classroom, wherever we are, we are our entire individual, all of our identity. And kind of thinking about that, thinking about making space for individuals in the classroom. So in um, computer science, uh, there's been a lot of work to get rid of the term master and slave, just as far as computer programs and how they work together. Um, and kind of thinking about that. So my guess is that there are aspects in various different disciplines that might make some part of someone's identity that might make someone feel uncomfortable. And being open to that, being responsive to that is really important. And finally, Natalia asks a really interesting question. Have you noticed patterns in how world history or colonial history is taught in different countries? What common threads do students bring to the classroom? That's a great question. Um, I mean, I think that you can always, you know, ask people, um, you know, what, what they've learned about this. But in my experience, what I've discovered is that um, most of the Chinese students that we see at BU um, know, just as one specific example, know almost nothing about the Holocaust. Um, they, they've, they don't particularly deny it. They just really know nothing about it. Um, and this is something that in general, most university professors assume that people know about. Um, so if you're teaching something and you say, well, that was in World War II, um, you know, kind of contextualizing that for students is really useful. Yes, universe, international students or immigrants need to be educated on American history and racism. Um, and also that this isn't something that just happened. So I think students think about it as there was the past. There was racism in the past. 
And now there's Black Lives Matter. And they don't see the connection. But of course, what I'm trying to say is, you know, if, if we're looking at things and we're trying to think about institutional racism in the US in general, it is all a pattern. This exists. It existed in the past and it exists today. And if students can see that continuum, that line that connects them, then they will start to understand this a little more. All right. Uh, Christina Michelle, do you have any parting thoughts with us for us? No, thank you so much. I love the um, really active chat box. Everybody's um, just thinking about these issues so much. It's really exciting. Thank you.